think so. Okay, great. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, the next presenter, uh, Damien Alam. Uh, Damien's first and strongest love has always been teaching, a graduate of New Jersey Institute of Technology, Science, Technology, and Society program. He is always fascinated in the interplay with connect human values and social trends to development in the technical world. We're earning his BS degree at NGIT. Uh, Deviant has also completed a history degree program at Rutgers University. While paying the bills as a security auditor and penetration testing consultant with Core Group, Deviant is also a member of the board of directors of the U.S. Division of Tools, the open organization of lock pickers. Every year at DEF CON, Shmoo CON, Deviant runs the Lockpick Village. He has conducted physical security training sessions for, for Black Hat, DeepSec, TorCon, HackCon, ShakaCon, Hack in the Box, <laughs> Inca Party, OzCert, GovCert, Confidence, the FBI, the NSA, DARPA, and the United States Military Academy at West Point. His favorite amendments to the U.S. Constitution are in no particular order. I kind of like that. First, second, ninth, and tenth. Everyone put their hand together for Devia. Right. All right. How's everybody doing? Very good. Welcome. This should be, should be interesting, should be a little different for some of you. Has anybody in this room ever done any lock picking? Has anybody not ever done any lock picking? All right, about half and half. I'm happy with that. Usually during my talks, there's, there's a bit of debauchery and fun and other irreverent things. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of you drink. The idea is on stage, you would actually prepare a drink and just tell the audience about your favorite drinks. You'd pour some. And if you mess up during your talk, well, you know, you take a drink. You'd also pour some others, and if the audience is really good for interaction, they get drinks. But we were told there are no drinks allowed in this room. So we can't play you drink today, I was sad. So I came up on a whim, I got some other supplies, and we're gonna play a game called Um Gunner. And I just made it up. So we're gonna, we're gonna rely on some of my friends in the front here. If you could take a Nerf gun and pass one to Pure Hate, get yourself some ammo. And I encourage any speaker who's bold enough to try to go ahead and play Um Gunner during your talks. And it, the, the way it works is, if you say Um ever in your presentation, someone gets to shoot you. <laughs> and I'm willing to bet we're not even going to exhaust one of these pistols because I'm going to try real hard to use those. Anybody know the secret to not saying Um when you present? What is it? Somebody might know it. You look at the audience. You don't look at the sign in the back. You don't look at your shoes. You don't look at your slides because you shouldn't be reading your slides. Look right at your audience. That's why you're here to talk to them, and I'm here to talk to you. So hopefully we won't be doing too much um gunning today. But you never know. We just might. How many are these guns? I sure hope there is. Take a, take a <laughs> test shot at the screen. I can't say. <laughs> you have to pull down on the thing yeah, and then try to shoot. There you go. Oh, yeah. Nice. That has some that has some range to it. <laughs> I just needed a practice shot. Oh, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> so you already kind of know who I am. I appreciate that people always invite me around to talk about usually locks, sometimes other things. You can often tell who I'm sort of representing based on what I'm wearing. So if I've been invited to you know, do something with my company, my company, the core group, does pen testing and services of that nature. If you ever see me just in plain old black t-shirt mode, I mean, I have kind of a hacky t-shirt underneath. I think I'm wearing syphil and Ollie today. If you see me at a hacker con, usually I'm with Tool. <coughs> Tool is a nonprofit just dedicated to lock picking and lock sport. So anytime you see us, please come around. We love talking about lock picking. We love for you to try this. If you have high-end technical questions, we try to answer them. If you just want to get into it because it's fun, we'd like for you to do that too. And let's get right into it. Let's talk about, the, we are actually talking about locks, mechanical locks today. A lot of times when you see lock picking on the schedule, someone will say, Is that, so you're doing like, like cyber locks or like locks as an analogy? I'm like, no, like metal in your hands, lock picking. So why does this matter? Why, why would you ever invite someone to a high-end tech forum to talk about shenanigans of this nature. Well, hopefully you understand 
You can listen to all these other excellent speakers and do everything they're telling you. You can set up your network correctly. You can just really lock down your data. But if, let's say, my company is hired to red team you, I'm immediately going to try to get into this room. I'm going to try to find the server rack and throw console cables into things. And it's, you know, allow any any is way faster than most just trying to pop remote shell and things like that. Yeah. Same thing with communications. That's, that's a big one now when we talk about how secure our communications are, right? People say, well, you know, we have this, we just paid all this money to 3Com and we have this B, you know, PBX thing and it, it talks to another PBX on the other side of campus and there's crypto and SSL session buzzwords. Like that sounds like you paid a lot of money, that's awesome. You probably still have a room like this in your basement <laughs> with a lot of copper trunking down to a patch panel. And again, if you get into this room, which probably has a crappy lock on it, just start clipping, clipping in, man, and start listening to conversations in the clear. And it's really, really funny on a deliverable day when you're playing an MP3 recording. And it's just the executives on the phone, usually about mundane stuff, trying to plan a lunch, like, oh man, it's his birthday? Oh, I guess we gotta get a cake. And they flip out. They're like, oh my god, how did you get our phone calls? Like, well, Vegas, you, you had a lock from Home Depot on this room that has all of your communications on it. So the way we kind of summarize it, we say, you do everything right here. And I hope you do everything right here. But it can, it can undermine if somebody just goes to Home Depot and doesn't know what they're doing. He says, well, I guess this one looks good. I'll get these. So yeah, lock, locks really matter. This really is essential just in the same way that all your firewall rules, all of your network segments, all of your actual data pen tests matter. Keep, keep your brain on this a little bit too. And of course, and it goes without saying, lockpicking is just fun. Even if you're not trying to justify it from a business use perspective, lockpicking is a really fun hobby. And even if you never actually mechanically attack your locks as part of a security eval, I think you should. I think it'll be instructive if you do. Even if you never do that, I hope you get to try it because some of you might just get a fun pastime out of it. I know we, a lot of us pick locks just sitting around as a hobby. We, I pick locks on the flight here. Anybody see me tweeting from the airport when I was in Philadelphia? Yeah, the fellows who were coming home from Afghanistan, I wound up in a conversation with some army dudes. And what do you do? Oh, well, lock picking, really? And I said, well, yeah, actually, you wanna you ever try it? And sure enough, these poor guys who were just hammered first time in 10 months back in the States lubed up on free lounge cheap cocktails and they're just, oh, look at that, open, open, woo, I gotta get on my plane. Yeah, it's, it's, a, <laughs> it's a fun time. I, I think you get a lot out of it. So, what does a lock signify to us? This is, there's a little bit more of a big think that I've kind of inserted into our talk today and I'll, I'll hopefully wrap it back around at the end if we get through everything in time. I liked this analogy that a friend of ours named Skyler had in one of his talks, he was down at RBA Sec, and he said the following story, the story of the four doors. He said, I want you to think about four doors. I'm going to paint you a picture, and I'm paraphrasing and adapting his story a bit, so he'll have to forgive me. Imagine you're meeting someone. Let's say you've called up a professor, and you say, I've got a question about the next chapter. I want to go sit in your office, or you're going to rent an apartment. You call. You say, yeah, I can be there on the 3rd at 4 o'clock. That works for me. Great. I'll be at that address. Let's say you go, you're going somewhere to meet a person on their territory. And you get there, and they're not around. But you, you call them up. You're like, hey, was I, it was 4 o'clock, wasn't it? I, I don't know. If, can you hear me? Well, whenever you get this, I'm, I'm here. You're leaving a message. You're like, I don't know. I, your, door's, your door's open. Should I... Should I sit down? What? Call me back. So the first door up there, the left door, the open door, what does that mean to you? How would you feel if you're, again, you're supposed to meet someone. Would you stick your head in? Would you, would you kind of you know, give it one of these, knock, hello, are you, are you here? Would you sit down if there was a couch right there? Would you sit outside? Would you wait? Would you keep standing? This is, there's no right or wrong answer. It's just what does the door mean to you? Portals and doors represent space, my space versus your space, whose space is private or public. So if that door was hanging open, many of you might choose at least to stroll around inside. Again, if it's an empty apartment, what's the harm? The door was open, you're supposed to be meeting someone. You might look around and when real estate agent, oh yeah, hey, yeah, I, I walked in, so this is a nice kitchen, you know, you might do that. What if the door was shut? 
Not a locked door, it's just a closed door. Well, you're supposed to be meeting someone, right? Maybe they're inside, maybe they're, maybe they're there already. Would you, would you, if they didn't answer with a few knocks, would you maybe crack it? And be like, are you, uh, are you in here? You got no cell signal in there? Are you, are you on singular wireless? <laughs> are you, I, I'm trying to call, maybe put it, close it again. You might crack, maybe you wouldn't. I don't know what you, what you would do. I'm not even sure what I would do. Every situation is different. But I'm willing to bet it would feel different between those two situations. Now let's talk about this. Let's talk about a door with a lock in it. <clears throat> what would you do then? I don't know. Hopefully the answer is not pick the lock, because <laughs> if, it's, if it's a lock that is not yours, you're not supposed to be picking it. That's one of the two golden rules of lock picking. You don't pick locks you don't own, unless you have someone's express permission, you have mine. You don't also pick locks on which you rely, because you might all try this, oh, this is so much fun, I'm gonna go try it on my door. Don't do that. It's unlikely, but you could harm the lock, and then now you can't lock your door. But how about this thought, locked door? Would you, would you, you know, if it's locked, would you kind of test it? Would you try to go around another door? Or would that lock mean something to you? You're like, oh, I, should, I should wait out here. Now the last one is where it gets interesting. Open door, unlocked, but there is a lock in the door. It's, it's a door outfitted with a lock. Now what you would actually do in that situation is immaterial because everyone's choices are different in all of these examples. But I am willing to bet, and Skyler's willing to bet, a lot of us are definitely willing to bet that that last door hanging open is different than this door hanging open. It's different in some way. Even though they're literally open doors, the space <laughs> and the notion of yours versus mine, public versus private, protected versus free, all of that is different just because of the mere presence of the lock being there. And it's a fun thing, I think, to think about. It's a fun way of evaluating what you consider to be your space or my space, what you consider to be appropriate, public domain, or someone else has taken the, the time to try to protect this for their own, their own safety, their own use. And a lot of what we're going to wrap up today and thinking about has to do with how locks impact our privacy. I kind of made this twist once we think about all the things in the news nowadays. Locks as a representation and as a guarantee of privacy, there's the, the obvious one, well of course it keeps people out, but there's another element to it. And once we talk about locks as they can or can't be compromised, hopefully you'll see that. And in that vein, I'd like to tell you about a very interesting knot. And some of you, if you're into actually rope knotting, may have heard of this. In fact, Don, you know what? I wish I wish I had. Does anybody, you know, the hacker type person, have a piece of paracord or have any kind of rope on them, or even a patch cable? Do we have a, an Ethernet cable laying around? Yeah, I'm going to borrow that, and I'm going to do something on camera in a minute. Thank you. I won't tie it up too hard. Sailors used to have a sail bag back in the day that have all their personal effects, and they just have it somewhere on ship. And when sailors would go on leave, some of them started adopting an interesting technique. One of the most common knots you can tie in maritime environment, what is that? Square knot. Square knot, also known as a reef knot. How many people can tie a square knot? Absolutely. There are a lot of Boy Scouts. It's, if you have never seen one or don't, let me see if I can flip back to my camera here. Square knot's one of the easiest things. You just go over one way, and then as opposed to a granny knot, you come around the same way, so you've got yourself a nice square. Did that come up pretty yep. clean? Square knot, really normal. Many sailors would use that to tie off their bag because they're used to tying a square knot. The thing is, if they were away on leave, on shore leave, if some people would rummage through their bag, if you have someone who's not supposed to be on the deck, you know, you're loading things, quickly rummaging through someone's bag and taking something, a lot of times, theft and other pilferage invasions of people's space would not really be noticed in the hustle and bustle of a ship in port. And sailors, if they're doing their job, they get back on ship, now they've got a lot of work to do, they wouldn't actually even get into their own effects bag until they're out at sea. And they wouldn't until, you know, they're nautical miles out, they realize, holy crap, I'm missing my, who knows, parrot food. I don't know what sailors need. <laughs> my dad was army. <laughs> <clears throat> so sailors started to, to, to adopt a new type of knot. Has anyone ever seen or heard of a thief knot? A 
It's pretty cool, honestly. E like exteriorly, it looks very similar. It's the same knot pattern. But what you have is a difference with the lead and tail ends. Now the thing about a thief knot is, you saw me whip that square knot together pretty quickly, right? A thief knot cannot be just looped and tied together. The only way to tie a thief knot is to take a bite of rope, and as if you were tying a square knot, you come in, you manually have to feed it around, back, and through. Now it's similar, but notice my loose ends are on opposite sides, right? It is virtually impossible to tie a thief knot accidentally. You have to make a really deliberate feeding of the rope around through its, it takes a, you know, it takes a moment or two of your time. So the idea behind that is sailors could very quickly, because if they tuck the loose ends back into the bag, no one's really paying attention to them. Someone just kind of whips it open, rummages through, they're probably going to just tie a reef knot to, to shove it back where they found it. And people could use this as a seal. They could immediately determine, hey, what I did, what I left here has been disturbed. And they would immediately say, who's took my ship? What, don't push away. Is somebody trying to sell my valuable whatever right out there on the deck among the ruffians? The idea of, I have secured this in a way that disturbing it will, will break what I have done is a really valuable function. And using appropriate locks, using locks that do not lend themselves to covert entry gives you that protection. The flip side, of course, is using crappy locks. You completely don't have this sort of ceiling protection. We'll get into that. So for those who have never done any lock picking, I really do want to spend time on this, obviously, because that's why you're here. Those who have done lock picking will go a little fast. You won't be too bored. Maybe it's a good refresher. But if you've never tried any lock picking, you may be fascinated to learn it is really easy. It's not a lot of movie magic. I mean, once you learn about it, you'll realize a lot of films treat lock picking pretty badly. If you ever see someone in a movie kind of walk up to the lock and they have one tool and they're like, all right, I gotta put this tool in, that is called a key. <laughs> lock, picks, lock picks are separate tools. You need almost at least two tools at all times. But they're very simple tools. And mechanically, what's happening inside of the locks we use every day, it's very easy to exploit these, these weaknesses. So here's some locks. Here we have a locking door knob. Maybe you've you know, used a padlock this morning when you were locking a bike up outside. Anybody bike here? It's kind of far, I guess. Padlock hanging sideways on a hasp. Here we have a deadbolt mounted in a door. All very different form factors of lock, correct? That mechanism in each of these pictures, and the mechanism in virtually every lock we use all the time, almost every lock in North America that we use is the same mechanism, regardless of the shape of the actual housing. This design, this pin tumbler design, it's about a century or more old, and it has been virtually unchanged in these past 100 years, ever since Linus E.L. Jr. started making these up in New England. <coughs> the pin tumbler design should be pretty familiar to most of you. The, the large brassy bit, the round part that turns, that's called the plug. And if you look down the keyway, you'll sometimes see if the lighting is good, and here we have kind of in shadow, we have this another bit of metal. And let me actually flip to the camera. I, I realize those of you who know this already are like, come on, show us the cool tools. So here we have our, our keyway, and if you just about can see, another bit of metal in there. There we go. Well, what is that extra bit of metal down the keyway? You're actually seeing one of the pins. You're seeing one of the many pins that are in these. Many of you know there's pins in these locks, even if you've never picked. But what are those pins doing? How do the pins interact? Well, let's put on our x-ray goggles. <coughs> this is what's taking place inside of the lock. Inside of a pin tumbler lock, we have one pin shown here in red. <coughs> That's called the key pin. That's the one you could get a glimpse of from the outside. It's called the key pin because when the blade of the key goes in the keyway, it rides into that pin. There's also, shown here in blue, the driver pin. <coughs> now that normally you'd never see from the outside. It's almost always way up high, too high of a mechanism to see. But that driver pin is what actually is holding the lock shut. So no key in the lock, 
you try to turn that plug, the driver pin prevents turning. The driver pin in this instance is what we would call binding. And it will do that when the lock is at rest in any position because above the driver pin you see a spring. That spring completes this whole affair that we would call the pin stack. It keeps the pin stack in that position no matter how the lock is mounted. So we saw the padlock earlier was kind of hanging on its side. Anybody do a lot of traveling around to let's say Europe? Anybody been in countries where this is the norm for locks? They're kind of, you have the teeth of your key that's called the bitting of the key. They'd be facing down as you stick the key in. That looks strange to our American eyes, but in places like Germany, that's just how the locks are all mounted. That doesn't matter. As long as there's no key in the lock, the pins at rest will be in this position because of the spring, and they will remain there unless they are lifted, usually by the insertion of a key. If you have the correct key, the idea is the pin stack gets pushed by the blade of the key just enough so that the split between those two pins, it's called the shear line, is at the edge of the plug. If the shear line is at the edge of the plug, the driver pin is up in the housing, the, the key pin is still in the plug, nothing is binding, nothing is blocking, the plug can turn. Mechanically, does this make sense? You now understand, fundamentally, most of the locks you use every day. They are not more complicated than this. Well, they're marginally more complicated. Marginally because there are more than one pin stack. Looking at it from the side, you see this is our same lock. But it's, again, it's the same type of mechanism as you go deeper and deeper in from the front face. Same driver pins, same springs, same key pins almost. The only difference is the height of some of those key pins. And the different key pins have different heights because they correspond to those cuts on the blade of the key. If you have the right key, when it's all the way in, everything can turn, nothing is obstructed. <coughs> Again, make sense here? Clear? I have no animation skill. This is all animated GIF images. I, I don't do flash. Simple as it gets, though. That is fundamentally everything that protects all of your data, all of your doors, all of your spaces. That's all there is to it. And the reason one key works, one key doesn't, is if so much as one bidding position, these, these positions all have kind of numbers. We often think from the shoulder of the key out to the tip. So here we have the second bidding position has been cut a little too deeply on the key. So this pin stack isn't pushed far enough. This driver pin is still binding. If one position is wrong, the whole thing doesn't work. When you tell people in computer science related fields this, they start thinking of passwords. They start saying, well, okay, so like off by one character, no good. By the way, that would be the same if it was too high. Those <coughs> red pins, those key pins, they'll bind and they'll, they'll jam just as effectively. So you have to have every position just right. But when you tell people that and their brain starts going into computer science mode, invariably somebody's going to do some crypto math in their head and they do some permutations and they think of key space and they say, all right. So I guess you just to attack the lock, you have to exhaust the key space. We have how many positions, how many differs. Oh, uh, that must be why Adrian has a big old mess of keys. Like you attack locks with a big pile of keys and you try every single key until one of them works. Well, no, you're not, you're not brute forcing like a password when you attack a lock. You don't have to try every single bidding combination in every single stack mm -hmm. position. We can attack locks, honestly, like, like breaking a password in the movies. And you'll see what I mean by that. And it has to do with flaws in the construction of the lock. <clears throat> here is our same lock diagram from the side. But on the left here, there's something new. This is the plug. If we remove the lock from its housing, we've dumped all the pins out of it, we pulled the plug out of it, you're sort of looking at the plug down from above. In a perfect world, locks would be manufactured with pristine, precise tolerances. So all of those chambers drilled into the plug, they should be the same size, right? I mean, all the pins are the same, the chambers should be the same. They should be lined up, perfectly plumb and true. That's how it should be. But anybody who's ever dealt with manufacturing knows we don't live in a perfect world. We live in a world of manufacturing tolerances. You pay for how perfectly aligned all of your cuts and drillings are. You pay for what quality of metal you're using. When you start scaling up, lock manufacturers have to consider costs for like replacing drill bits. How often during the line is running during that, how often they have to stop and retool the line. 
Have you ever tried to drill into a curved surface? Do that a thousand times an hour. See how well that starts working out for you. This is a brand new lock, right out of the box, stripped apart. They are not beautiful, pristine holes. The pins themselves have blemishing and pitting and scarring. There's, there's a lot of little imperfections. Not so bad that the locks won't work. I mean, a manufacturer knows you stick the key in, you expect it to turn, or else people won't buy your product. But little blemishes like this, little errors like this, they're not so awful the lock won't work. They are a problem, however, when you think of how the lock binds. Here is our same lock from the side. Now, do you see? It's a little, it's very subtle. Do you see what I've done on the left there, the plug? Do you see those errors, those misalignments? That's how every lock really is when you get down to it at a small level. So if you have a lock with misalignment, a little bit in every chamber, and you try to turn that plug with no key, you don't get a binding action in every chamber. You don't get the lock binding on every driver pin. You kind of have the most misaligned pin will start to hit, and then the other pins do nothing. They just kind of hang there. If you have a bunch of people in formation and they're all raggedy and they're not standing perfectly lined up, and you say, everyone step forward, and everyone starts stepping forward, one person is going to hit this table before the others. That person was a little bit further to begin with. Think of it that way. That's what's happening right here. No key in the lock, we try to turn it. Does it make sense why only one pin is binding and the others are not? Because of that, if the lock is binding one pin at a time, we attack locks one pin at a time when you're picking. Very gentle turning pressure causes a pin to bind. If you lift, if you push on that pin stack, it's got nowhere to go other than up or down. I mean, it's in a chamber still. It can only go up, essentially. And when you're going up, click, 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 move, 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 push, 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 it eventually has to reach the right height, the height the proper key would have raised it anyway. When it does, this particular pin stack is no longer binding. This pin stack is no longer holding the plug back. The plug can turn very slightly. It's not enough to open, but what will happen is the plug will turn just enough for the next most misaligned pin somewhere else to now be binding. But look at the one you've lifted. It's the driver pin that was binding and now no longer is binding gets sort of hung up on a little lip there. Does that make sense why the plug, if it turns just a hair, now this driver pin is caught this key pin might fall back down. You, you don't care about that. If you move your pick away, the key, the red pin, that might flop back down. But as long as you maintain very gentle turning pressure, and it's really gentle. We'll try to give you some tips about that. Maintain very gentle turning pressure. You'll get the driver pins to stick, or what we would call you get them to set, just at the edge of the plug. And the red pin, the key pin, will just fall back down way out of the way. And you, I hope you understand, I mean, these colors are for our purposes of discussion. They usually aren't colored. There are sometimes colored pins in locks, and that's a funny other story to ask me later. But ultimately, that's what you're doing when you pick locks. Gentle pressure, lift until you get a click, and then you try somewhere else and get a click, and try somewhere else and get a click. You're maintaining this gentle turning pressure with one tool. There's our turning tool that goes in. And then it's this game of hunting around. It's this exploration, sometimes we would almost call it like seeing with your hands, because it's not a very visual element. There's not a lot of looking into the lock, it's feeling. You say, this is loose, this is loose, well, this one feels a little stiff, and maybe you even get a click. It's feeling the difference between loose, no binding action, versus stiff, friction, like, ooh, I think I've got a binding pin, click. And it's very, very gentle and subtle how the difference is felt. It's not easy for a lot of people when they're starting out. But the idea of no, no pressure or, mm, this is pressure, click. You will be able to develop that sensation. You'll be able to feel that tactile feedback. And eventually, you'll really get used to it. Okay, I'm clicking all these. I must be getting close. You'll certainly know it when you've only got one left. Because when you finally get that one to set, now nothing is holding, and boom, the whole lock just clicks right over. That's all there is to it. So that's why I say it's kind of like hacking passwords in a movie where all the numbers are like spinning, but then one like locks in, it's like Z, and then this is like seven, and this is Q, and they're like, oh, the missiles are gonna launch. 
<laughs> yeah, you can, it's like gaming a slot machine. You can hold certain <coughs> wheels in the desired position as you continue to keep pulling the lever on others. And if you do this right, most locks we use nowadays are susceptible to these sort of attacks. The, the elements involved, the pick, the turning tool, and they're just little pieces of metal. They're not sophisticated bits of equipment. We have some you're going to try, and you'll, you'll pick them up. They look kind of neat. They're like, oh, I want to get a set of these, and Adrian has some for sale. <laughs> but other than that, they're not sophisticated pieces of equipment because it's not a sophisticated attack. Mechanically, <laughs> nothing really major is happening here. The biggest problem, incidentally, that you will encounter if you're just starting out with picking tends to involve too much pressure. Here you see someone starting out the right way. They say, all right, I've got some turning pressure. I'm feeling around. Ooh, I feel some friction. Click. Boy, this is easy. I can't believe I, someone said it. I've tried picking. This is kind of neat. I mean, I feel another one. Click. But they get a little too adventurous. They get a little too excited. They're like, oh, I'm going to get this lock. Ah! Well, now what happens? Now they push too far. Now that's never coming down. Unless, of course, you release your pressure and let everything back down. They have overlifted that one chamber. A red pin, as we said before, will bind just as effectively as a blue pin. The only problem is you don't want the key pins ever binding. You push way too far. That happens to us a lot in public demos. We have a lecture like this. Everyone kind of dives in and tries it. And then other people come around. Oh, what is this, that picking? I've seen that. And they kind of look at people, and they look at people, and say, you put the thing in, and you push. Oh, I can try that. Let me. Are you using these? And they kind of take some tools, and they're going, and, they're, and we're kind of, who's that guy? Is, is he, you need any help? How you doing, sir? You need any help? He's like, I, I need help. I got them all jammed up, but it's not going. And you're like, you weren't here for that lesson, were you? <laughs> yeah, you don't want to just jam everything as high as possible. It's just enough. That's what you're going for. It's a lot of very subtle, very gentle action. There are some other tools that people will use when picking. For instance, rakes. Rakes are designed to touch multiple pin stacks at once. So it's not a deliberate, I'm going to try this, then I'm going to try this, then I'm going to, you're not deliberately trying each chamber. A lot of people like to joke around and say it's like fuzzing. It's like you're fuzzing the lock. Way faster than even this diagram can animate and, and represent. Scrub, 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 varying your height, varying your angle. You're just throwing a lot at the lock, hoping it will open quickly. I realized this whole time, I've been standing up here, what is, what is a talk without the chance for failure? So let's go ahead and, and see if I can pretend to know what I'm talking about to you. So I don't know if we can see. Here's a, here's a lock. <coughs> Shout at me, I can't see my own camera. Am I on camera up here? Yes. So here we have a turning tool. Very light pressure, very gentle pressure. And I'm going to use a little raking pick here. And if you try it, when you try it, try talking to others. Try, you know, oh, what brought you to, to Ohio? How would you find out about this event? The more you're focusing on what you're doing, the harder it gets. I'm definitely up here. I'm pushing too hard. I'm probably getting frustrated. But if I keep BSing with you guys, if I keep saying, oh, so... Who's, oh, there we go. Look at that. So that, that worked pretty well that time. If I look up at you, I don't look at what I'm doing, things will open. Yeah. Raking. Way faster, usually, than individual lifting. Question. Now, is there a technique you use of raking to make sure you don't overset a pin, or if you did overset a pin, then maybe like every few seconds just let it be low? Yeah. Every, Adrian makes a great point. If you're raking, it's, a, it's very much one of these kind of things where you're going very feverishly with one hand, but you're trying to be very gentle with the other. So how do you know you didn't overset or overlift? I will, much like you, I'll come off my turning pressure for a moment every so often, just sort of resetting. If, if I haven't gotten it in a few seconds, I'm gently sort of resetting as I go. Raking, faster, but don't be tempted. I feel like Yoda saying yes, the dark side, of course. It's sexier. So the way I like to talk about raking and lifting Raking is like the automatic transmission, right? You get in the car, you press the gas, and you just get to your destination. This is more of a stick shift. You are deliberately choosing every shift, everything you are doing while driving. Many people buy automatics, and like, unfortunately, I sold my old Jeep, so all I have is an automatic these days. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with an automatic transmission, unless you've never, ever driven anything but that. If you grow up, 
How many people grew up and actually learned how to drive a stick shift? Good. That makes me very happy. I feel like an old man. Like these kids today with their music. No, they, they kids today don't learn how to drive stick shift anymore. So if you've never sat behind the wheel of this, and one day your buddy's drunk and you gotta drive home from a party, if they have an automatic, that's fine. If they, however, you're like, oh, three pedals, what do I do? I encourage people when they're starting out, try the lifting technique first. Try at least to get your hands involved in that vein. Because if you've never developed any lifting fundamentals, if all you've ever done is rake locks open, you will eventually encounter one that you can't rake. A lot of aggressive high-low bidding, something that just needs lifting. When that happens, I hope you have that fundamental to fall back upon. What's this in the middle here? Is this a lifter? Is this a rake tool? Well, it's kind of both. It's kind of neither. That's a half diamond. That's one other tool that's popular in a lot of kits. I love having one around. Yes, you can lift with it. You can also kind of rake or even what we call shovel with it. It gets underneath really tight pins very well. The great thing about having a half diamond, however, it's probably the only thing in your kit that is fully flat and straight all the way out to the tip. <coughs> Every other type of tool ends with some curvature. The half diamond has this flat underside, and that's excellent if you ever need to explore in a lock. Take a half diamond upside down and insert it in and lift all the pins simultaneously. It allows you to then slowly extract it and listen and try to hear how many pin stacks are in the lock. You'll hear them snap, 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 falling off the edge of the half diamond. So here we have Adrian's locks, and I don't know what he's pinned for a lot of these and how he's put this together. I'm just going to say, well, what's this one deadbolt here? I don't know what it's got. But if I go in and if I shut my loud mouth, maybe some of you up front will actually be able to hear. Sounds like five pins to me. And that is pretty typical. That is the most common type of pinning. You'll see five pins is the average residential kind of lock. In most commercial spaces, you'll usually see five pins too. Sometimes six. But it's a great tool to have around. All these tools are very typical in your average lockpick kit. <coughs> now there's something else in your average lockpick kit. The turning tools. We talked about them earlier. And this will almost be a dissonant thought in your head. But believe me when I say the turning tool matters more than anything else in your kit. Your, and the turning tool doesn't look as cool, right? It is a bent piece of flat metal. Your fitment of the turning tool, your diligence with just subtle and precise pressure, your ability to finesse it very smoothly, the turning tool makes all of this mechanically work the way you want it to. It makes the binding action just right, it holds the pins in position, the pit is just moving some stuff around. If the turning tool isn't doing its job first, or you're not doing your job with the turning tool, nothing you do with the pick is going to matter that much. So let's talk about that quickly. Really briefly, turning tool, application of pressure. I don't like it when people try to hook their finger around and pull with the turning tool. I don't think it's a very precise, controllable way of getting on that cleanly. And even if I were up here telling you that, the same joke we always tell in the lockpick village when we get to this slide, you already know this is wrong. You don't need me up here telling you. Why? Because you've seen infomercials and this is in black and white. And if it's in black and white, you know the person can't make pasta correctly and they can't poach an egg and they're burning their ironing. And, Are you tired of your locks not opening? Right. Hooking the finger around doesn't give you this really finesse sort of touch. Pushing with the tip of a finger is, in my opinion, much more controllable. Some people even say the further out down the shaft of the tool that you press, you can get more you know, variance and kind of dial it in. That could be valid. I'm usually around the middle. As long as, no matter where you're applying this pressure, it's soft pressure. The tip of your finger should always be fingertip colored. If it is not, that's way too much pressure. And that look like, ah, oh, look at that asshole. No, like that's not a lot of pressure. Look, just press your own finger. It doesn't take a lot to make it start to turn light. Really light pressure on these tools. Lighter than you can ever imagine. Some people make the analogy of a modern membrane keyboard, a laptop keyboard. Less pressure than you need to press the key. I even sometimes make the analogy with some people where I say, imagine you just have this pick tool and it's kind of just flopping 
in the keyway, falling out like that. Enough pressure that all you're doing is preventing that flopping action. That's enough pressure. Just gentle, there we are. That's enough pressure. It will astound you how little pressure you need on that turning tool. Most turning tools, especially all the ones out here, are edge of the plug turning tools. They go in away from the, from the pins. They have this long sort of head on them. Away from the pins, get a nice purchase in the keyway. Yes, that will compromise your workspace a little bit, but on most big old American keyways, there's so much space it doesn't matter. Really, the only problem you have to worry about most of the time is if the turning tool slips down and gives you friction along the plug wall. There are some people who like other types of turning tools, sometimes called flat or Euro style because European locks have such tight keyways. These go in the center of the plug, and the idea is they won't go in as far because you can't start running into the pins, but it gives you more room to work. Now, the flip side of that is they don't achieve very good bite in the keyway. They'll sometimes fall out. I think they're harder to use if you're just starting out. That's why all of ours are edge of the plug turning tools. Practicing with some of the locks up here. If, again, if you're just starting out, we're going to have you dive in. The practice locks that we have, look for, if you're just starting out, anything with labels on them. These padlocks do have some labels. These little loose cores all have labels, progressive lock labels. All of those are the same lock repeated over and over, but with pins removed. So like lock one, this is lock one. Really, really easy lock to fix. Bad for security, good for learning. Grab lock one to try that out to get your hands comfortable with the picks, to try to see if you can feel, am I turning it, am I pushing, click, oh yay, it opened, awesome. Reset it, try it again. Find what's comfortable, and once you start getting it, you're like, oh, I think I feel this. Then, try it like this. Try it with no turning tool at all. Say, all right, I feel, I feel a spring, but I don't feel much. Add the turning tool, now you know where the binding pin is. There's no mystery of, I wonder which pin is binding. It's the only pin in the damn lock. Try it again. Alternate back and forth between no turning pressure and adding a turning pressure. You'll try to maybe pick up on loose versus binding. Do you think you feel it? Or you're just comfortable enough with the position, you say, I'm going to try something else. Look for number two, look for number three. By the time you're hitting four and five, you're picking real locks out of the box. Most padlocks are four locks. Most door locks are five. Some commercial spaces are six. We got some six pins out here for you. Adrian's Tower might even have some six pins somewhere. You never know. But it's not hard with basic, basic locks. You all can do this. Whether you're lifting directly, whether you're rocking, how you're holding it in your hand, we're happy to give you a little bit of advice and say, well, that might not work for you. Why don't you try it this way? But ultimately, if it's working for you, that's fine. Whatever's comfortable in your hands and is getting lock opens, getting locks open, go for it. That's fine. As long as the locks are behaving correctly, awesome. You are picking. It's not more complicated than this. Remember always as you're trying it, relax, relax, <laughs> relax. If it is not working, you are trying too hard. You're either pressuring too hard or lifting too high. Talk to your neighbor, get something to eat, get something to drink. I know I'm holding you up from food. I got a lot more to talk about, but how are we on time, actually? We've been doing this for what, 20 minutes? 30 I kind of minutes? managed over the first one, so yeah, yeah. No, we have to I still got, I got about 20 minutes, maybe. Yeah. We got time. Preach. Yeah, but ultimately, just relax, and it'll work. And when it does work, it makes us happy if we hear, open. We hear you say open when the lock is open, so we know you're actually learning this stuff. And if you want to try this, almost everything on the table here is pretty easy. Ask me if you have a question, is there anything weird about this lock? And I might tell you, oh yeah, that one's got some anti-pick elements. Most of them don't. If you're curious what I mean by anti-pick elements, pick-resistant locks, manufacturers build these usually in one of two ways. Either they start making their keyway tighter, crinklier, narrower, more jagged. Obviously, it makes it harder to get tools moving around. I mean, like this is a real keyway. It's pretty nuts. Also pretty expensive to manufacture something like that. So instead, what most lock manufacturers will do is not mess with the keyway, but mess with their pins. So some manufacturers will make what are called spool pins. Mechanically, you guys can already tell what happens here, right? If you try to turn this, if you try to put some turning pressure and then go for lifting, you can get bound up on the edge and the lip of that spool. Now when that happens, 
key pin and the driver pin, the spool driver, are only touching way on this edge. So it is possible to attack anti-pick you know, pins, pick-resistant locks. Have a look at these little black lines that I've drawn on this animation here. If you have encountered a spool pin, you'll often know it. If you've encountered any kind of anti-pick pin, the plug is really skewed over, like 10 degrees of a turn, and you're not open. You're like, and now I can't even move my jam. I'm jammed in there. Yeah, you're, you're hitting a spool somewhere. Try to find a pin stack that if you give it a little more pressure, it makes the plug want to almost what we would call back rotate. Do you guys see that? It's coming back on itself ever so slightly. Because the pins are skewed out, you're making them occlude that gap, close it back up just slightly. This involves even less pressure on the turning tool than you had been using, and a little more oomph underneath. But you can sometimes get it to just barely back rotate, often in the process unsetting other pins you would set, so it's frustrating. But this is, it's possible to attack these pins. It's annoying, but it's possible. There's many ways of implementing this kind of blocking, this kind of resistance. This is a mushroom pin, same idea. Serrated pins are just designed to jam everywhere, just really heavy friction, forcing you to try to push a little harder and maybe oversetting accidentally. There's a lot of manufacturers that go to extreme lengths. This is a Swedish company, Asa. They make what Han Fei, a friend of ours, calls the sneaky pin. And it's not only a giant spool with a rim in the middle of it, but it even has counter milling inside the plug. That's not something that I expect anyone here to be able to tackle, and fortunately I didn't bring any. There's about six, seven people in the world I know who can tackle these reliably. But as you get more and more advanced, a lot of companies will explore this design, this idea of adding an extra lift, an extra element. Most of the time, they're very hard, they're annoying, but lighter touch, more diligence, you'll get through them. You can get through them. I, I trust you. I think if you really try it, you'll be able to do it. Ask us if you're curious about which ones are spooled. We'll be able to tell you. The answer is not too many. Let's talk about a completely different kind of attack, though, because a few people, as I was setting up, they said, oh, what is, what is this weird-looking thing? What is that for? Anybody know what this is? Bump, bump, bump hammer. If you've never seen lock bumping, let's talk about it really quickly. <clears throat> Closely related to the physics you might see in a game of billiards, depending on what science teacher is setting up a pool table for you. Anybody remember their Newtonian laws of motion? If I shoot this pool ball, what's going to happen? Two ball, moves. two ball moves. Absolutely. Transfer of energy, three stay still, two moves. That's what happens in a lock when you use one of these snapper guns. Sometimes you see these in spy catalogs and weird magazines. The idea is the needle arm goes into the lock, the long handle gets pulled, and the needle arm smashes against those pins with the desired effect of the red key pins staying where they are and the blue pins all jumping up for a second. And if they jump up simultaneously, you can try to turn really quickly and just get it turning. It works about half the time, I think, if you're lucky. It's not something I carry around. The pick gun is big, it's, it's annoying, it looks really suspicious, it's not very covert, it's kind of loud. I don't personally like pick guns nearly as much as I like bump keys. Bump keys are, oh, that's a little slogan that our friend T would always tell us. I, I love putting it up there now. He says, four snaps, two times. If it doesn't, snap, 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 no, snap, 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 snap. If it doesn't work in four snaps and you tried it twice, stop, try something else. Here's something else you might try. A bump key is designed, just like the idea of a pick gun, delivering a blow of force into every pin stack, virtually simultaneously, from beneath. A bump key is, however, just a small cut key, a key with very low ridges. Well, we can see that there. There we are. Just a series of low ridges. Let me back on that. Do you guys see how that would work? If you smash this into the lock, it'll knock into all the pins and hopefully drive the driver pins up. Now, there's a couple of ways to do it. Some people will cut down the shoulder of their <coughs> bump key allowing it to almost over-insert. This, also called the minimal movement or negative shoulder or push method, will deliver the same force, but I think it's a little more elegant. I think it actually delivers the same force without smashing across all the pins. It just kind of taps into them. Both methods, some people think, oh, I like this one better than the other. Both methods work pretty reliably a lot of the time. 
I personally like the minimal movement or the negative shoulder. Here, again, if I'm on camera, you can kind of see that wiggle. I can get this to over insert slightly. The idea when you're bumping, have your hand right on the key. Don't apply hard pressure before the hit comes. Why? Because you're, you're binding pins at that point. You are jamming them before they've had a chance to leap upward. Gentle, just barely a whisper of pressure. If someone was using the first method where you have to pull it out, your pressure is so light that the key would actually slip through your fingers as you're touching it. But in this one, I'm just going to barely whisper some pressure and give it a little bit of a flick right as this hit comes. So it's a very little flick and a lot of hit. How much hit? Uh, if you miss it, will hurt. It's, it's not like a, I'm just tapping away, I'm tapping. No, it's, you've got to give it a pretty good wallop. There we go. So that works. That's, that is open. And of course, this is not a working key for this lock. This is a bump key. There we go. It's not hard. Mechanically, does that make sense, what's going on inside of this lock? Open up, see some nods. People are getting hungry, they're getting tired. What's going on here? Yeah, it's, it's really one of the simplest attacks ever. Now, there are, there's a whole white paper that our friends in Holland wrote about this. If you want to learn more, we'll throw the link back up at the end. It's not good for the lock, I should point out. Please don't do that if it's a lock you like. There are manufacturers who've been trying for a while to prevent this from happening. One company made the anti-clock or the anti-bump lock. The idea was these extra chambers of pins, very high pressure springs, that normally did nothing during lock operation. But if you bumped and the lock was turning and there was no support under the key pin, these so-called trap pins would fire and actually jam the lock in a not open, it would, it would fail secure. The problem was you actually had to drill the lock out at that point, there was no way to service it. So in America, what companies have done is experiment with other means of not quite destructively preventing you know, the lock from bumping. Here's a neat idea that one, one company made, the idea of pins that were almost like a tongue and groove system. This was the Corbin Emhart. So the pins could cleave apart sideways, but they couldn't separate vertically. Neat idea. Turned out to be a little overcomplicated, and then a company called Medico sued them because they thought the idea of chisel-tipped turning pins was too close to their idea. You can't find Corbin M hearts too much anymore. What you can find is the Master Lock Company experimenting with top capping, experimenting with making a driver pin that doesn't fall down into the chamber all the way so that there's this gap preventing energy transfer. If you don't want to have a lock that has been specially tooled and prepared because this chamber up here is fatter than this one, if you're not retooling your whole assembly line, or if you already have a bunch of locks already installed somewhere and you don't want to go buy new ones, you might be interested in Kava Ilko. The Ilko company makes a replacement driver pin set. It's a very thin, very low mass, almost looks like a nail, tiny driver pin coupled with a very high pressure spring. So you swap out one of your driver pins for this. And yes, it might still jump ever so slightly with a bump hit, but it'll crest and fall back down before the other pins have even made their ascent, and it screws up the timing. Very, very difficult to attack a lock <coughs> by bumping if one of these is installed. I like them a lot. They have a part number and everything. I mean, you can, you can order locks pre-configured with them, or you can just have a locksmith buy a bag of these. 10 bucks for a bag of like 20, I think. It's not a very expensive idea if you want to retrofit all your locks to make them bump resistant without replacing everything you own. And you see a lot of companies kind of, now once bumping hit the news, has anyone ever seen bumping like on, yeah, it's like I've been on local news in Philly talking about this. Once bumping started hitting the news, oh boy, people like that. That was like, it was like low fat. Everything that was always low fat, but like, look, no, whole wheat bread, now low fat. Like call it no caffeine. I mean, it was always that. This is the Quickset Smart Series, which was a new idea, this user rekeyable lock that Quickset had been working on for a while. And as soon as bumping became big, they slapped this little shield on it. They're like, bump guard protection. Well, because it's not a pin tumbler lock. It's a completely different lock. We'll talk about why that is in a minute. Ultimately, yeah, I mean, sure, you can't bump it. You can attack it other ways. One last note about bump resistance. Please, I would discourage you from ever using this product Buster. <laughs> it's like this greasy goo that you squirt in the lock. And it's like frustrating.
accelerates pin movement, prevents bumping, makes them stick together. Uh, yeah, and you can prevent car theft by slashing your own tires, I guess. <laughs> why would you do that? I don't get it. I don't know why this product has to be a place in the market. If you're really worried about bumping that much that you're willing to do something to every lock you own, add the anti-bump pin. Don't squirt goo in the lock. Let's talk for a second about high security locks. We have oh, probably about 10 minutes left. Interesting facts about how some companies do high security. I want to start to compare what we've talked about so far with some other options in the market and what it means when you're thinking about your actual security. Many companies now, popular idea is to augment the standard pin tumbler mechanism with an additional element somewhere else in the lock or elements. Most often this is done by the use of what's called a sidebar. You'll hear a lot of, lot, this one has a sidebar. It has two sidebars, a double fitted sidebar, blah, blah, blah. A sidebar typically is another element in the side, oh, figure that, of the plug that will only fall inward if other conditions are met or satisfied in some way. So if you've ever seen a key that looks like two keys sandwiched together, that's almost always the sign of a sidebar based system. This is the ASA twin, the B10 lock. Also, the Swedish company has been making this for years, and the idea, in addition to conventional pin stacks, there are also these little pins, sometimes called finger pins or side pins, all of which are getting lifted in their own right so that the fingers of a sidebar can come in. And it's obviously much harder getting under there, trying to lift those extra finger pins. It's a very hard lock to pick. I don't really know anybody who picks this lock with any reliability at all. It's a very cool design. Here in America, we have the Schlage Primus, same idea. The idea is you have a series of extra pins in the side of the plug, the sidebar, working in concert to another series of key pins and driver pins. Neat idea. Here's less of a neat idea. <laughs> Let's come back to that Quick Set Spark series. How did they do you know, high security? Well, very hard lock to pick, and it has that feature of being user rekeyable, yes. How do they do it? Well, they don't have sets of pins in the lock. They have one pin in each chamber. It's multiple pin stacks, but the idea is it's not a driver pin and a key pin. It's just a key pin with a little nub on the side. That nub is interacting with a plate of metal. You might call this a wafer of metal. Wait, there are different types of locks called wafer locks. We don't always like to call this that, but it's, it is a wafer-based sidebar system, the idea being that if you lift, like a regular key goes in, touches a key pin the way it always has, but the key pin is not pushing a driver pin, the key pin is driving this wafer plate which allows the sidebar to fall in or not. Lots of false notches as you might see on the side, so trying to turn it, try to put turning pressure and then picking is very hard. There's no bumping of course because there's nothing to bump, there's no pins separating. Neat idea. And the user rekeyable function has to do with the fact that I won't get way into it, but the mechanism, you can, you can disengage the pin, the red part, from the wafer plate. You can change out your key and re-engage them together so that wafer plate can be installed at various heights in every position. And that's how the lock can get re-keyed without taking the whole lock apart. Now, a friend of ours figured something out, though. It's really interesting. He said, no matter how this is installed, if you lift the red pin, the key, if you lift the key pin all the way up, <clears throat> you suddenly expose this large space. Because you understand when the lock is operating, see this little nub? This whole area, right across here, that's an open window, as it were, looking in from the keyway into where that wafer plate is in every position. It has to be, it's not a solid flat wall. It needs to have that open access to, to allow this nub to interact. So if you lift the pin all the way up, all of a sudden the rest of the wafer plate is accessible from here in the keyway. And what a friend of ours built was what he called the Quickset Smart Decoder. He built it for about $6 worth of parts. He has a blank key, a needle, a little piece of shim metal, a little roach clip, some glue, and JB Quick. And he just made this. He made a blank key with a little pennant flag on the end of this needle. And the idea is you can insert this in the keyway, reach in and slowly turn, and the, the little flag will brush across those teeth. And it doesn't open the lock, but you can count them. You can count, click, 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 click. Oh, there's four clicks. Huh, all right, well, that 
that's installed in position two. Click, click. Oh, three clicks. Look at that. That's installed in position three. You quickly write down five numbers. You make yourself a new key. You can decode these locks very quickly. So yes, very pick resistant, but I wouldn't call this high security. This is the actual element right here. This is the little pennant flag touching those teeth because it can reach right in through here. There's that large window where this is the nub on the end of the reddish pin in my diagrams. This is the large window you're actually reaching in. This wafer plate would be right on top of the window normally. Really elegant attack, really brilliant, really good guy. His name is Shane Lawson. And he just thought, you know, he was sitting with DOS Man. He's like, he looked at DOS, he's like, this can't possibly work this way, can it? And he, they took it apart. He's like, whoa, look at this. This sucks. <laughs> so it's, it's great. It's a great attack. It's very brilliant. Now, there's also another little problem. And I'll skip through most of this video. Turn my sound off here. When we were experimenting with this lock, we were talking about it to a dealer. We were actually out in Vegas for DEF CON getting a bunch of supplies. And this dealer said, oh, okay, you know. I've got so this and that. Oh yeah, you've seen those new quick sets. You've seen the tool for them, right? I'm like, what, what tool? He's like, you know, the tool. But he holds this giant, angry, plugged thing up. Like, what is that? Like, that's not the tool our buddy made. He's like, yeah, it's the smasher tool. What? Well, all of those, you know, you're not talking about pin, pin, blocking action. It's little plates of metal and wafers of metal. It's smaller, lighter components. What people figured out, there's a company called Major Manufacturing, a gentleman named DeForest, Bill DeForest, who made a special type of pick. He's passed away now, but he owned Major Manufacturing before he died, and this is what he made. He said, all right, well, if I just stick, it's essentially a blank key, or a three-cut key, made out of hardened bar stock. He says, all right, I'm just gonna stick this in, and the, the plug doesn't wanna turn, and I'm saying, you know, I'm not even mounting this in a door, just holding it in my hand, I can still get enough torque to kind of do this. Crunch. <laughs> it just crushes the wafer pack and jams the sidebar and it blows it all out. You know, it just so there you go. All right, that's so that's open now. But now the real crazy part, and think back to you know the sailor's bag and the thief knot and everything else. The crazy part is, it's horrible for the lock. But if you're done doing whatever you wanted to do, you come back and you can crush it back the other way and relock it. <laughs> Now, that doesn't always make the original key keep working. <laughs> I've seen it work once or twice after that. But ultimately, yeah. I mean, you're, you're talking about... <laughs> yeah, that's a sayonara to that. You're, it's a very, it's an unconventional attack vector. But you have to consider that. If you're thinking of your security, consider the unexpected attacks. Consider the unconventional attack, yes. Did the Schlage, um Secure, uh, oh, secure keys key. work the same way? They do. The Schlage secure key, have you ever seen a Schlage lock with a little plus sign on the front of it? That's the secure key. That's what I got on top of that one. Oh, really? Look I know that. they have suited, that. so you, they're supposed to be hard to find or something. They are very hard to find. They uh, quick set suit them. <laughs> <laughs> it was really funny. We were talking about this in the car on the way here. I said, what, what's up with that secure key? I said, the funny thing about that secure key, they looked at what quick set did, and they said, well, we can change it just enough so we don't get sued. It didn't quite work. They changed it just enough that it broke all the time. <laughs> but it still wasn't different enough that the courts agreed, so they still got sued and they settled out of court. But yes, the locksmiths hated it. The security didn't work very well. It broke a lot. Question right here, yes. Yeah, how do you deal with double-sided keys? Double-sided meaning there's bidding on the one side and bidding on the other? Yes. Often, that's, the, that's sometimes just what's called a convenience key where the user can insert it either way, but it doesn't matter. Sometimes the element in the lock really is only one-sided. If it is not, what you might use would be a turning tool that allows you to reach in from multiple sides. So here we have a conventional turning tool. This is what's called a wishbone or tweezer turning tool. So it'll achieve some bite in the keyway and allow you to make a turning pressure but not block the top or the bottom of the keyway. So you can work this way, you can work this way. There's other types. Many times you're talking about what's called a wafer lock, 
uh, automotive situations, file cabinets, and you might use entirely different tools called jigglers. We have some of them we can play with too. But that's a very good question. That's, what, that's the best way I would describe that. What I want to wrap it up with some, some big thing, and then we can all eat, because I'm clearly, I'm always hungry. Um, yeah, so no one shot me when I said um on that one, really. <laughs> have they been missing out? Have they been doing their job? Did I say any other um so far? Oh, look at that. Shoot it! Oh, <laughs> Perfect lunch analogy. So, consider unexpected attacks when you think of your security. I love this sort of bike lock analogy because I started to learn about an interesting thing that bike thieves were doing in some cities. Are you ever familiar with people who will lock their bike up and actually look and check the, the pole that they're trying, or the, the meter, anything? Some bike thieves will actually wait for someone to lock their bike. They come around at night, and they have compromised the poles in an area. They'll rip the entire thing out, <laughs> steal a bike, and then wait like a week later, and they'll circle back to see who else is locked up to that pole. And some other poor sod gets their bike stolen. And this idea, if you start looking around some cities, I used to date this little girl in Chicago, and we started walking to Chicago. Chicago's not the most secure city. And I'm right outside of her house looking around. I started looking at street poles in Chicago. Now that's kind of the lighting. I don't know if you can see the lighting on that slide there. Notice we have nice galvanized steel bolt, 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 no rust. Rusty bolt, that's strange. <laughs> What's up with that? Well, someone had cracked the old bolt, pulled it out, and replaced it. But more important than that, when they did so, does anyone see this hole right here? They had lifted the whole pole, replaced the bolt so it looked like a bolt, and just let, left the pole in it. Walking around late at night in Chicago, we started finding some poles that were just gone. <laughs> we think, I think people were doing this. Or it's Chicago, so people were just stealing them and beating each other up. I don't know. It's a <laughs> Sorry, from, from Chicago, my, my apologies. But yeah, consider weird, unexpected attack vectors. The idea of, are you preventing just covert entry or brute force attack or what exactly? Here we have three very, quote, high security locks. One is just a standard pin tumbler mechanism. A nice one, but still just pretty standard. Here we have a mid-grade, this is in what's by Avis, we use what's called a rotating disc mechanism, but there are some specialized attacks for that lock. And here we see an Amloy Protec, actually my personal favorite lock that exists. I always travel with these on my bags. This is what locks up our guns at home. The Amloy Protec, has no known attack or bypass. There's just no known vulnerability for it right now. All three of these are very resistant locks to bolt cutting, wrenching, smashing. They're gonna resist brute force very effectively. But are they going to resist covert tools and tactics? Think about that. Think about in the real world, yes, you know, picks and this and that. This is not as common as this. This is this is lock picks in the street criminals world. But think about if security really matters to you, think about the covert entry element. Think about if I'm using, if I'm only just buying this lock, yes, I'm protecting myself from brute force, but am I protecting myself from covert entry? Think about the idea of if you've been gone for the whole weekend, you come back to your house. The door is still on its hinges. The, the glass is still in it. Nobody has smashed in. The same thing with this office building. Glass is all there. The lock hasn't been drilled. Nobody is smashed in. But has nobody been in? I don't know. If it's a lock that could be compromised like this, you don't know. If it's a lock like this little Protec here, I mean, this is not a huge, this is not the Protec from the slide. This is a tiny shackle. Someone could cut this. That's the only way someone can compromise this lock, though. Yes? What about the uh, tin cam thing? Oh, shimming or something? Yeah, yeah you can't shim those. Okay. They have double ball mechanism. You have, the gentleman asked about shimming. If you've never seen shimming, we'll show you shimming. Later, once we've eaten a little bit. But like, when I travel, I have Pelican cases. I have nice heavy luggage. Here's one sitting on the ground here. They all have alloy locks on them. As long as I'm picking up my luggage and the case hasn't been ripped apart and the lock hasn't been cut, which happened once, I instantly know that no one has been in there. That is my thief knot even stronger than rope. I mean, it's, that is my way of knowing that nothing got in. So think of your security in this fashion. Think of your security 
in terms of what do I do when it fails? I promise by the last three slides. Expect your security to fail or break in some manner. Fail isn't bad. Fail and fail happens, right? <laughs> and if you expect it, and if fail is just part of how you think of your security, you can learn from it. Here, let's look at two examples of fail. Here's one guy. He's about to fail. There he goes. <laughs> All right. Trying to look cool on a bike, sir, and now you're holding your head. But his fail was kind of minor, and he probably learned from it. Famous video from the internet. Here's another guy on a bike trying to look cool. He's also about to fail. He's going to fail more catastrophically. Oh, <laughs> See those prices right horns. But that's a pretty rough fail. That is a colossal fail. That is, oh my god, my eggs were all in one basket. Now what do I do? I'm in the hospital. I think, you know, fail is good. I say three cheers for fail. Here's to fail. If you plan for if your security fails, what will you do? That's normal. That's how security is supposed to work. Security is the three R's. It will resist attack for as long as possible, but everyone forgets the rest. When your security does fail, you should be able to recognize it right away. If that fail is covert, if someone is picking in, you can't recognize there's even been an intrusion. If you force somebody to go brute force, you can recognize it right away, and then you have the chance to recover, to respond. You get all the three R's if you're using really good locks. If you're using locks that are not so good, that are vulnerable to a lot of picking, I don't really know what you're protecting. You might be protecting yourself from some junkies. I don't know if you're really protecting your data the way I think you should. So I'm sorry if that's uh, a harsh reality. I'm sorry if I'm telling you to replace all your locks or think about replacing some of them. But I hope that this does resonate for you. I hope this makes sense the way I wanted it to. And I hope you didn't mind listening to me a few extra minutes before we, we go eat. So thank you for listening as long as you did. I don't know if I have any questions. I was going to ask about the TSA locks. Have seen those with the... Uh, yeah, there's one on there. We can talk about them once we're eating and stuff. Yeah, we're going to spread some food out as they're getting ready. All this that's up here... People are more than welcome to play with this. People are more than welcome to try any picking you want. We'll clear all this out after lunch is over, but for now, get yourself some food. We'll talk about it. We'll, bull we'll BS about it. Anything you like, uh, I'll be around. So who 